Distinguished Ambassadors, Dr. Ionai Jinga, the Permanent Representative of Romania to the United Nations. Honorable Mr. Adrian Zuckerman, the Ambassador of the United States of America to Romania. Dr. Thomas M. Kelly, Head of School at Horace Mann School in New York City. Dr. Vasile Nicuara, Director of the Mircea Cilbatun National College of Constanza. Director Horia Sabin Bergoi of Clubul Copilor Sector 1 București. School directors, instructors, professors, debaters, academicians, volunteers and guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2020 National Romanian Public Forum Debate Tournament, the first ever nationwide public forum debate competition in the country. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this project is not about me. It's an event of the people, by the people, and for the people, and the people are us. The instructors, professors, and volunteers who generously donated their time, knowledge, and effort to teach and organize. The students, the world's future, who have invested their time and hard work to learn the art of active listening and civil debate, thus advancing democracy, cooperation, and peace. And of course, the supporters who genuinely want the new generation to succeed. And what a journey this has been. An unexpected pandemic changed our ways of life, tested our resolve and imagination, and brought out the best in many of us. After meticulously planning this tournament at the gorgeous Sinaya Vala Shipotului camp, we had to reinvent this activity online. So for the past two months, gifted instructors from the United States, dedicated professors and volunteers from Romania, and a diverse group of talented and inspired young Romanian high school students have worked together online to further the art of civil debate in public forum style. I cannot overstate how grateful I am for their truly incredible generosity and effort. It's been a real privilege to work with all of you. I would like to introduce Dr. Ion Aijinga, who has been a role model and inspiration to many young people for his work in improving world cooperation and peace through diplomacy. Dr. Jinga is a man of great integrity and a diplomat who was named the Ambassador of the Year 2007 in Belgium, Diplomat of the Year 2012 in both London and Romania, and Diplomat of the Year 2015 in the United Kingdom. His Excellency, Dr. Ion I. Jinga, Romania's permanent representative to the United Nations, is our honorary speaker and goodwill ambassador and will address our assembly next. Thank you. Thank you, Teddy. Do you hear me? Okay. Good morning everybody in New York. Good afternoon for those of you who are in Romania. Ambassador Adrian Zuckerman, dear organizers, ladies and gentlemen, dear young friends, professors, professors from my high school in Kumpulung, Dimitru Golescu. When, uh, when Teddy Gana has asked me to choose um, a topic which may fit uh, to the current um, hectic time we, we live in, I thought it may be suitable to approach um, the issue of, of diplomacy in times of pandemic and beyond. And to connect it to the idea of empowerment and accountability. I feel um, myself privileged to speak to your public forum debate as I always enjoyed young people's curiosity to question existing rules and their enthusiasm to experience new avenues. A brainstorming with, with people of your age keeps adults' minds alert and students' questions may help teachers to better understand topics they are talking about. At least this is my case. Since uh, the moment when men appeared on earth, all generations of children consider themselves smarter than their parents. And all parents believe they were more responsible as youngsters 
than their own children. And uh, every generation, all they knew is right. I was your age and I sympathize with your search for answers because it was also my search. This is why there are always young people in my teams and apparently they enjoy working with me. Some of my previous young collaborators are now ambassadors or directors in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And um, I do hope some of my current young colleagues one day will be in leading positions too. When they succeed, it is a confirmation that my values and principles are correct. A public forum debate may be a good test of aptitudes for those of you interested in diplomacy, international relations or politics. But I warn you that in diplomacy, the recipe of success is a drop of inspiration diluted in a bottle of perspiration. But if you find the right dosage, this potion might be highly rewarding. <clears throat> of course, high school students have a long road to walk before they can be diplomats. But maybe they can start a journey on this path by practicing public forum debate and building necessary skills. To succeed in a debate with time constraint, one must remain calm under pressure and make tough decisions. But this is essential in diplomacy too. Debate requires flexibility to adapt one's arguments to what opponents argue. Again, this is very important in diplomacy. And debate teaches the power of ideas, but arguments and ideas are also key weapons of diplomacy. There is no single definition for diplomacy. For instance, Sir Harry Wotton, which was the envoy of King James VI of England to Venice, confessed in 1604, so many years ago, that an ambassador is an honest gentleman sent to lie abroad for the good of his country. For Lord Palmerston, the mission of diplomacy was reflected by the axiom, we have no eternal allies and we have no perpetual enemies. Our interests are eternal and perpetual, and those interests, it is our duty to follow. At Versailles Peace Conference in 1919, David Lloyd George, another British Prime Minister, remarked that diplomats were invented simply to waste time. Well, it was his opinion. In its turn, Sir Winston Churchill reportedly said, Diplomacy is the art of telling people to go to hell in such a way that they ask for directions. Funny, huh? For, for the Chinese Prime Minister Chu Enlai, all diplomacy is a continuation of war by other means. And last but not the least, for Harry Kissinger, diplomacy is the art of restraining power. Well, after 28 years in the Romanian diplomatic service, my conclusion is that diplomats are made, not born. No one is born with the ability to practice international diplomacy, which requires to understand foreign societies, to influence governments, conduct negotiations, anticipate threats, and take advantage of opportunities. All these skills have to be acquired. Diplomacy, in my opinion, is learned both from books and practice. Professional diplomatic services require proper training, career development, tools, resources, and authority necessary to get the job done. Good diplomats have more to do with sacrifice and refrain than with champagne and caviar. Above all, what must always guide the action of good diplomats is defending and promoting the interests of their countries. They must show ability to remain calm and composed in stressful situations, 
capacity to absorb and process large amounts of information from different sources, communication skills, impeccable reputation, and high integrity. Good diplomats do not confuse information with analysis or analysis with judgments. You know, President John F. Kennedy once said, a man may die, nations may rise and fall, but an idea lives on. Diplomacy is based on the power of ideas. Therefore, diplomats training and professional development is not a luxury, but a necessity. The mantra among career diplomats has long held that on-the-job training is the only way to learn how to practice diplomacy. But I believe if you follow this path, diplomats posted abroad may need years to get a decent grasp of what exactly their job entails. On-the-job training may work great if one is lucky enough to have good mentors, but that's not a given. Equally important is the formal preparation. Countries are much better served by having an embassy staff that is well prepared before being posted and which benefits from continuity and institutional memory as diplomats pass the torch to their successors. Some, some countries do not have proper professional diplomatic services. They have civil servants in their ministries, ministries of foreign affairs, some of whom are sent to work in embassies and consulates. Many of these officials have degrees in international affairs or a related field. And that's enough for governments to assume that they can excel in diplomacy. Other countries offer only initial training to new, new recruits and it tends to focus on area studies such as the politics and economics of geographic regions, as well as foreign languages, of course. Others put a big emphasis on humanities courses, but the ability to make conversations at cocktails parties is not as important today as it was in previous decades. There are also many countries which have dedicated centers that provide training in skills and where diplomats get connected to the global agenda. Usually, these are countries with long diplomatic traditions, such as Romania or the United States of America. What I was telling you does not necessarily apply to ambassadors because the ambassadors are appointed by the head of state, which may be a president, a king, or a queen, and they represent the head of state. Therefore, ambassadors can be chosen among diplomats, but also they can be politicians, lawyers, business persons, journalists, or even artists. What is essential for them is that they enjoy the trust of their head of state. I am a career diplomat, but each person is different and each professional path has its own particularities. I believe that in everyone's professional life, there are trains to catch. If it happens to be in the right rail station at the right moment and the train slows down. If you think that it may be your train, then do your best to catch it. <clears throat> you may miss some trains in your life, but be careful because there are not too many. Whereas there is no one fits for all recipe to become a good diplomat. Some tips might still be useful. First of all, as I have already mentioned before, you need to have a 
strong commitment to your country's interest. Then you need extensive knowledge and experience in international relations, capacity to resist under various types of pressure and to make difficult decisions in complex environments. Equally important is the ability to absorb and process large amounts of information from different sources and to prioritize them for prompt decisions and swift action. Ability to identify key strategic issues, opportunities and risks. Capacity to oversee the production of complex analyses, reports, briefings. Flexibility in leadership, empowering collaborators to translate vision, eventually your vision, into reality, but giving them autonomy and delegating assignments. Whereas taking personal responsibility for shortcomings resulting from such delegation. Good diplomats also have negotiation skills, reputation for dealing honestly and openly with issues and stuff, and the ability to lead, build trust, motivate, supervise, mentor, and work in teams. You have to have verbal and written communication skills because a good diplomat must be able to convince other people to embrace his or her ideas as more powerful, more powerful than blood and money is the power of ideas. Finally, you must have an impeccable professional reputation and personal integrity. But dear friends, the arrival of COVID-19 suddenly ended the diplomatic lifestyle that has existed for decades. Diplomacy at the United Nations and elsewhere has moved to phones, emails, and virtual meetings. Teleconferences and secure video have become the norm, making more difficult to engage in delicate negotiations. A global pandemic is not the best time for diplomacy, as some fear that the virus crisis could fuel diplomatic atrophy as the quarantine measures have prompted questions about the very nature of this profession. If there is a global center of diplomacy, it is the United Nations headquarters in New York. Every year, it hosts thousands, thousands of meetings, not to speak about the informal diplomacy which takes place over coffee, working lunches, dinners, or receptions. As uh, Secretary General Antonio Guterres remarked in an interview in 2017, the United Nations must first of all be an instrument for a surge in diplomacy for peace. But this year, important summits and international conferences have been canceled or postponed. This September, the high level week of the General Assembly session, the celebration of the UN 75th anniversary, or the Biodiversity Summit, to mention just few events, will most probably take place in virtual formats. While current transition to digital diplomacy may bring a sense of modernity to our profession, the intimacy in diplomatic negotiations risks to be lost. You know, personal chemistry between diplomats should not be underestimated. And anyone who has spent time in negotiations can confirm the added value of a discrete chat which can, can make the difference and even change the outcome of, of those negotiations. And even more important, because international affairs are influenced by leaders' personalities and their relationships, changes that reduce the scope of their personal interaction can have, can have consequences. No one knows when the crisis will end, but there is no doubt that it will affect all of us. I'm fully convinced that the future will rely more and more on connectivity, fluid networks and collaboration. Understanding how best to use networking is increasingly important for countries and international organizations. 
And as diplomats adapt to a world of virtual meetings, there is little doubt that the struggle between traditional and modern diplomacy will end with the victory of the latter. Thanks to the internet, we live today in the age where the audience is always in the same room with us. Take as an example your form. Four months of pandemic advanced the digitalization as during four years in normal times. Information technology is now part of modern diplomacy and the ability to use social networks along with having a strong market approach will be mandatory attributes of diplomats. Despite technological advance and the Twitter and Facebook revolutions, I believe diplomacy will remain a centerpiece in listening and understanding the position of various parties. You know, in the clash between a growing international interdependence and tendencies to isolationism, Diplomats may become promoters of a new concept of globalization. Physical borders will remain, that's for sure. But the widespread exchange of data, knowledge and experience will create new opportunities for diplomats. They will learn to use scientific and technological advantages to promote political and economic goals of their countries and equally important, maybe the most important, to get access to vital resources for their countries. Speaking uh, about the virtues of multilateralism and diplomacy in times of pandemic, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres remarked that this is the biggest international challenge since the Second World War. But multilateralism it's not only a matter of confronting shared threats, it is also about seizing common opportunities. And we now have the opportunity to build back better than in the past, aiming at inclusive and sustainable societies. <clears throat> Indeed, as every cloud has a silver lining, Changes in response to global crisis can breed new norms. At the United Nations, for instance, complex working methods have been created over time and once established, they are virtually impossible to change. Coronavirus crisis may be the catalyst to update rules in multilateral diplomacy. Quoting again John Fitzgerald Kennedy, who's imaginative diplomacy once saved the world. Change is the law of life, and those who look only to the past or present are certain to miss the future. So, my younger friends, who wants to become a diplomat? Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Jinga, for an inspiring and heartfelt speech and for your generous support of young people. Let's have another round of applause for His Excellency, the one and only Dr. Ion I. Jinga, the Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Romania to the United Nations. <clears throat> 